All right, thanks, Zach. Thanks, teens. Good afternoon, teens. How y'all doing today? Oh, is, it, is this pre-teens? Yo, this is the best part. How you doing tonight, teens? You guys doing good? Yes, it is great to be here. If you have a Bible, please turn with me to 1 Kings 18. My name is Emin. I help lead. I lead the Sydney Teens Ministry. And today I'm actually not going to be doing a lesson by myself, as many people have thought. I'm actually going to be doing a lesson with one of the Sydney Teens, Kaden Jung. Kaden Jung. If you don't know Kaden, he looks like this. So try to find him around the room. But we'll be doing a lesson with him. Um, and just before we begin, I have really important announcements. So you guys got to pay attention, okay? I'm not going to repeat it. You got really important announcements. The first one is all about the highly anticipated event of this season. It's the Spa Teen Formal, which is happening tonight. You guys excited? What's going on? Spa Teen Formal! Yeah! yeah. Yes. All right, I have three quick instructions that everyone needs to remember. I'm not going to repeat it, all right? Number one is... Come to the final lesson dressed up. So if you're going to the formal, if you bring your dress and stuff, come to, the, come to the lesson, to the main room dressed up. The reason why is because the event is Broad Beach Cultural Center. And that is an 18 minute walk away from this place right here, which is the Gold Coast Convention Center. So we're actually gonna need to walk, but if you, if you come and you, and you dress up after the event, what's gonna happen is the line's gonna be long and the event's gonna go way longer and it's only going to be 20 minutes. So you need to come to, your, to, to the event tonight dressed up. All right. Second one is meet at the foyer at 745 in front of the coffee cart. There are a few team leaders that will bring you to the event, and that's these people. Dylan, Cassie, and Brad. Okay? So if you see that handsome man in the fellowship, just follow him. Actually, let's make all the teens sit at the left side, and if you go into the formal, go straight afterwards. Don't talk. Don't dilly-dally, let's go straight afterwards, and you're gonna meet right in front of the coffee cart. All right? Does that make sense? And last one is, entry is $15 per person, it's $30 for two people, it's cash or bank transfer. Um, if you don't pay, you can't go in, all right? But in saying that, I've seen the games, I've seen the food, I've seen this playlist, it is worth $200. Unbiased opinion. Does that make sense? So come to the final lesson dressed up. Meet at the foyer at 7.45. If you're late, we're going to leave without you. And entrance is $15 and $30 for two. Any questions? All righty. Everyone should know. All right, I have Simon to come up for a few announcements as well. Uh, I got two announcements. Uh, firstly, at 8 a.m. tomorrow, Emma's going to go to the beach for a swim, whatever she's thinking, I don't know. Uh, so if you want to be there, then go there at 8 a.m. And then at 9 a.m., me and Joel will be running a quiet time slash Bible talk, uh, going through uh, Romans 5 to be really good. So just come along. Everyone's invited. It's going to be a great time. So, yep, that's everything. Amazing. Well, if you have a Bible, please turn with me to 1 Kings 18, 16 to 39. You guys should already be there. But today we're going to look at one guy named Elijah, and he's a man of conviction. And there's a lot of things that we can get out of the story, but I want to focus on what can we learn today as a teens ministry. What does it look like for the teens ministry to move forward? 1 Kings 18, verse 46, is about the prophet Elijah on Mount Carmel, and he challenges 450 prophets of Baal to who is right? Is it God? Is it Baal? Who is right? So we're going to read a reading from 1 Kings, verse 18 to 16 to 39. You all there? Yes. Yep. All righty, let's start. 1 Kings 18, verse 16 to 46. It says, Elijah on Mount Carmel. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. When he saw Elijah, he said to him, Is that you, you troubler of Israel? I have not made trouble for Israel, Elijah replied, but you and your father's family have. You have abandoned the Lord's commands and have followed Baals. Now summon the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel and bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Azariah who eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent word throughout all Israel and assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. Elijah went before the people and said, How long will you waver? between two opinions. If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, 
follow him. But the people said nothing. And Elijah said to them, I am only one of the Lord's prophets left, but Baal has 450 prophets. Get two bulls for us. Let Baal's prophets choose one for themselves and let them cut it into pieces and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. I will prepare the other bull and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. Then you call in the name of your God, and I will call in the name of the Lord. The God who answers by fire, he is God. And all the people said, what you say is good. Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one of the bulls and prepare it first, since there are so many of you. Call in the name of your God, but do not light the fire. So they took the bull, given it, and prepared it. Then they called the name of Baal from morning till noon. Baal, answer us, they shouted. But there was no response. No one answered. And they danced around the altar they had made. At noon, Elijah began to taunt them. Shout louder, he said. Surely he is a god. Perhaps he is deep thought or busy or traveling. Maybe he is sleeping and must be awakened like Noah called Antonio. So they shouted louder and slashed themselves with swords and spears, as was their custom, until their blood flowed. Midday passed, and they continued their frantic prophesying until the time for the evening sacrifice. But there was no response. No one answered. No one paid attention. Then Elijah said to all the people, Come here to me. They came to him and repaired the altar of the Lord, which had been torn down. Elijah took twelve stones, one for each tribe descended from Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Your name shall be Israel. With the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he dug a trench around it with large enough to hold two seas of seed. He then arranged the wood, cut the bull into pieces, and laid into the wood. Then he said to them, Fill four jars with water and pour it on different offering and on the wood. Do it again, he said, and they did it. Do it a third time, he ordered, and they did it the third time. The water ran down around the altar and filled the trench. At the time of sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, Lord, the God of Abraham, Israel, and Isaac and Israel, let it be known today that you are the Lord, God in Israel and that I am your servant and that you have done all these things at your command. Answer me, Lord, answer me, so these people know, so that these people will know you, Lord, our God, and that you are turning their hearts back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and burned the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, the soil, and also licked up the water in the trench. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Then Elijah commanded them, Seize the prophets of Baal. Don't let anyone get away. Sweet. We'll stop there. So it's a story where one man steps forward in front of 450 people. Elijah here, he's, he's talking to the Israelites, and the Israelites are talking up, Who is right? Is it God or is it Baal? Is it another idol? So he proceeds to challenge the prophets of Baal on one major so showdown, and he wins. Right? The title of my lesson for us teens today is called Step Forward. Step Forward. All right, let's bow our heads in prayer before I, have, before I say my points. Let's bow our heads. Lord God, I'm just grateful and thankful, God, for you and everything you've given us, God. Thank you, God, just for an amazing time in the Gold Coast where we get to worship and really praise you, God, and see the amount of how you've been really working in our kingdom, God. But even just see the teens' ministry, God, and how you're really moving it forward, God, and that you're making the next future leaders and the next generation of, of strong disciples, God, in this room, God. I pray you speak through me, God, in this passage, that you may take me out of this, God. Um, let me just focus on you and your word, and let me see what I can learn as well as much as the teens. Love you, God, so much. You say my pray. Amen. Amen. All righty, I have three points for us this afternoon. And my first point is fully devoted. Fully devoted. All right, fully devoted. And before I begin, I want to ask you guys, what makes the best fans in the world? What characteristics would you say make up the best fans of the world? Would you say it's passion? Would you say it's commitment to your team? Maybe it's determination, maybe it's zeal. I think, personally, a lot of qualities that people underestimate, but arguably is the most important, is the idea of loyalty. Loyalty. Loyalty in a fan base can make a team crumble within a year, but it can also make a team grow exponentially with loyal fans. Because with loyalty, you'll be there through thick and thin. Right? There are some examples of athletes and teams that aren't the best but have the most loyal fans. 
right? Thick and thin, despite everything, and every time the team loses, these fans remain strong, right? Some examples I had was like Arsenal, the football team, Nick Kyrgios, and Ethan Kravenko in baseball. <laughs> if you follow one of these three things, it means you're, you're suffering currently, but it means you're loyal. If you follow one of these things, you are a loyal person, and I respect you. The opposite is just as true. I think the worst fans in the world are the people who say they support teams, but have no loyalty, no devotion whatsoever. Loyalty and full devotion is not just seen in sports, teens. It's everywhere. It's in marriages. It's in your job, the people who you value, your friendships. If you don't have loyalty in these things, those things just crumble. Those things just crumble. If that's true in the world, how much true is loyalty and devotion for us as disciples, teens? How much true is that for us? Right? The story of Elijah and the prophets it starts off with Elijah being indignant and angry, not just with the prophets, but he was also angry with the people of Israel. Why was Elijah mad? Was it, they, you know, why was Elijah mad at all the Israelites? Because if you actually think about it, the Israelites, they weren't the worst of the worst people. They used to follow some of God's commands. They probably still follow some of God's commands, and they're not necessarily like evil. We've read stories in the Old Testament where people were murdering, where people were adulterous, people were liars, people were stealers. If the Israelites, they weren't as bad as these people. In fact, I think the prophets were worse than these people. So why was Elijah mad at these people? Well, the answer had to lie with their loyalty and with their devotion. In verse 21, it says, Elijah went before the people and said, how long will you waver between two opinions? How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. The reason why Elijah was mad at the people is because they had half-hearted devotion and no loyalty towards God. It wasn't about who had more sin, who was saying what, what type of sin these people had. It wasn't about that. But the people of Israelites could not give their lives fully to God. And they had half-hearted, partial devotion towards his commandments. These were the type of people that Elijah was most angry against. Because, teens, in the war between God and sin, you cannot play both sides. You cannot play both sides. You can choose to live the best of both. You cannot choose to live the best of both worlds. You can either be a disciple or a follower of the world. It's a life fully devoted to God or nothing else. And Elijah was angry at the people who wavered between two lives, God and Baal, because these were the worst of the worst. And even though this story takes place thousands of years ago, right, the problem of people wavering between God and the world remains the same. I think it remains the same. And dare I say, as teens, far too often, I see it within us as well. Right? I, see, I hear people say, I'm a Christian, or I believe in God, I follow God, but also live differently towards the teachings of the Bible. I've seen teens live differently in school, at home, in secret. I've seen them live differently towards their friends outside of church. And that's not true and right devotion towards God. It's just like the people of Israel. It's just like the people of Israel. These are the people that Elijah calls out. How often are we fighting our half-hearted loyalty and devotion towards God, right? And if you think about it, what does half-hearted devotion look like as a teen's ministry? What does half-hearted devotion look like for us this afternoon? Well, I think there are a few signs. I think one area where we can be half-hearted with our devotion is no effort to be repentant. We have sin. We understand all of us sin. But if we're giving in to sin day in, day out, making no effort to change, no getting open, no confessing in the light, no memorizing scriptures, it's choosing to live in sin. It's half-hearted devotion. I'm only going to follow you, God, until life gets hard. What else does it look like? I think acting differently outside church. You know, people say they're Christians, or oh, I, I, I identify as a Christian, but if you're in school, if you're swearing, lying, with drugs, sexual morality, if you choose to follow God only in front of Christians, outside of people, you are just like the people. You are just like the people. What else does it look like? I think disobeying some of God's commands, right? We've, we've, uh, we love some of the commands that God's given the Bible. Hey, let me love one another. Hey, let me, let me do my best, right? But we hear commands like, 
right? Not even a hint of sexual morality or even here like stronger commands, right? Go and make disciples. And we think, oh, I'm going to follow some of God's commands, but I won't follow some of these ones. That's disobedience. That's half-hearted devotion. Far be it from us if the people in this room, the spa teens ministry, choose to follow God half-heartedly. So my question for us is how is our devotion towards God? Look at your own lives, teens. How is your devotion towards God? When the people outside this room talk about the spa teens ministry and their devotion towards God, what would they say? What would they say? Will people talk about the half-hearted disciples like the followers of Baal, wavering between the culture of the world and the Bible, or do they see prophets like Elijah standing up for the truth, following God no matter what happens? A true believer of God is indignant and angry against half-hearted commitment and devotion towards God in their own lives. If you teens want to step forward in your life, you've got to have full commitment and devotion towards God. Right. What does the full devotion look like? I think it's a lot about having integrity. That's a big first step. Let's learn to have integrity as teens ministry. I'll let Caden share a little bit. Yeah, so Edmund's point on in having integrity as a disciple. As teens, I think it's easy to live different lives, whether at school, at home, or in the teen devo. But it's important to have integrity as a disciple and being fully in the light. This means confessing sin and being fully open with, with where you're at. I'm super grateful to have an awesome disciple, um, Jack, that I can be super open to. And as it says in Proverbs 18, 13, whoever conceals their sin does not prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. We've also had the boys' D group in Sydney where we inspire each other to step up as leaders. Sorry. Step up as leaders. Recently, I've, I've been pretty disconnected from the fellowship. Because personally, when I'm away from the fellowship and not meeting with the body, I can find that it's easy to live a very different life. And because I think that no one, no one will find out about my sin. But after the boys' D group, I got in heaps of advice and was able to bounce back from my half hearted devotion. So let's be teens who confess our sin and have integrity in all aspects of our lives, just like Elijah and Mount Carmel. Let me get this right back up. Oh, beautiful. No, you're good. How good is Caden, man? Come on, Caden. Amazing. Amazing. All righty, sweet. Yeah, so let's be a teens ministry that's fully devoted towards God. Being devoted wherever we go, whether it's school, at home, or teens, let's learn to have integrity, getting open, confessing our sins, and being repentant about our sins. Far be it from the spa teens ministry to waver between the culture of the world and the culture of God. No, step forward and be fully devoted towards God. Second point, second point is challenge the culture. Challenge the culture. If you look at this point, it's a lot about, if you actually look at the story and you take a step back, you realize the main gist of the story is about one man fighting 450 prophets of the Baal, of, of the, of prophets of Baal. And it's crazy, it's different. But it's something we need to learn as a teens ministry. Caden's actually going to preach his point, so I'm going to give it to him. Okay. All right. Point two, challenge the culture. Challenge the culture. In this passage, we see Elijah taking a stand for God against the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. During this time, the worship to Baal was prevalent and normal. So when Elijah stood against the prophets, he was standing against the social norms and the culture of that time. There had also been a major drought throughout the land because of the sin and idolatry that was present from the prophets and followers. Uh, Elijah, who was, Elijah, who was only one person, manages not only to stay faithful, but prove the prophets of Baal wrong, as well as terminate them from their leadership. Okay, Elijah challenged the culture and saved God's people, setting them on the right path. Yeah. As a result, not only does the rainfall and water return, but also faith in God's people. Elijah stood up against the culture of his time. You know, just sharing from my own life, when I go to school, some things that stop me from standing against the culture is worrying about my reputation, image, or popularity. But this exposed my heart and revealed how I viewed my image and reputation over God. I viewed my reputation and image over God. But then I read a scripture in 2 Corinthians 5, starting in verse 14, 
For Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now, so from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view, the way we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, and the new is here. Skip down to verse 20. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making an appeal through us. Christ's death on the cross for me, as well as my friends, as well as the promise for life after death, has motivated me to repent and start, stand up against the worldly culture. This repentance has encouraged me to reach out to one of my friends from school, and his name's Wen, who is now a baptized brother in Christ. Yes. Let's go, Wen. When, have I, when and I have also been reaching out to friends at school, and one of the boys' names is Carson, and we've been inviting him to teen events and teen devos, and hoping that he studies the Bible and gets baptized. Yeah, come on, Caden. Brothers and sisters, it's easy, easy to praise God when we're at teens and we're at church whilst we're surrounded by fellow disciples, and it's easy to shy away in school uh, when we're not surrounded by fellow disciples. It would have been easy for Elijah to shrink back and not stand against the 400 prophets of Baal, just like Ahab did. But Elijah knew that God was with him, and so he stood, stood firm against the culture of the world. We should not be like Ahab, who abandoned God and followed everyone else, but like Elijah, who amongst the 450 prophets was the only prophet of God. Just as Elijah stood firm against the prophets of Baal, we too as disciples need to stand firm against the culture of this world. So teens, I have a question for you. Are you, a, are you a follower or are you a prophet? Are you a follower or are you a prophet? I just want to open it up. Uh, what does a follower of the world look like? Yeah, Zach. Like kind of fitting in school, but like following in like who God is now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like close yeah. friends. Mm, true, true. Um, here's what I've got down. Uh, uh, with the crowd, loved by all but not by God. Yeah. Trying to fit in with the crowd by swearing, making crude jokes, and even foolish talk. Another, secondly, uh, worshipping something that doesn't last. You know, something temporary. Worshipping money, relationships, and even the newest trends. And lastly, following anything and standing for nothing. Yeah. Standing for things that are not eternal. Something that's futile. doesn't matter. However, we should be a prophet. You know, what does a prophet of the world, of, of God look like? A prophet of God is outside the crowd and alongside God. Standing out from the crowd, being a true disciple and not give, giving in to worldly culture. Uh, secondly, worshipping God. Worshipping something eternal that lasts forever. As it says in 1 Timothy 3.15, we worship a living God. And lastly, a prophet of God speaks, speaks the word of God and stands firm in the faith. You know, not just talking about the words of God, but showing it in your life. Mm -hmm. And, and, and uh, having convictions. Yeah. As it says in Hebrews 4.12, the word of God is alive and active. So teens, are you a follower or are you a prophet? Okay. Elijah was a prophet of God and not one of the 400 followers. Just as Elijah stood firm against the prophets of Baal, we too need to stand firm against the culture of our time. So teens, how are you going and standing up against the worldly culture at school, at home, and in the teen divas? How are you viewed at school? Are you viewed as radical and faithful? Or are you viewed as nice and passive? Do people know you as a disciple of God? Or are you no different from everyone else? As disciples of God, we should not be followers of the world, but stand up against the worldly culture. Uh, I've read down some practicals. Number one... Ask to study the Bible with three friends. It's simple as that. Think of three of your friends' names, because you guys have three friends, right? Think of their names <laughs> and write them down in your notebook right now. You know, another point, taking ownership of the teen's ministry. Is it the teen's ministry or is it the teen leader's ministry? It's the teen's ministry. So take ownership of it. If they need you to sing, you sing. If someone needs, to, if someone needs help to stack the chairs, you help out. If someone feels like they don't belong in the teen's fellowship, you become friend, friends with them and bring them into the ministry. Yeah, Third point, be obedient to your parents. Yeah. 
In the world, it's common for teens to be rebellious to their parents, and it's almost acknowledged as an expectation. But the Bible teaches us, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Yeah. So teens, let's be a ministry that challenges the culture and has radical faith just like Elijah. Thanks, Caden. Great point. Great practicals. Took a lot of notes. Alrighty. One last point is turn their hearts. Turn their hearts. All right. Turn their hearts. Sometimes being successful is focusing on what's most important. For example, if you were a fireman, right, you could focus on many things, looking good, being strong. But at the end of the day, if you're not C, saving people, it's a waste of your job. If you're an athlete, just like Julian DeBerg, or this guy, I don't know if you guys know this guy, best basketball player in the world, you can probably have A, be focused on your muscles. You could probably be B, famous. But if you're not doing the most important job, which is C, winning games, you're gonna get fired from your job. Unlike this dude, right? What if you are a student? If you are a student, you could either have A, have a life, B, you could get some sleep, or C, do you want to graduate? Because I know one of the teens wants to. And I see a lot of you guys sleeping, all right? Sometimes you got to focus on what's most important. Finding out what's most important is key in being successful. And so I want to ask you guys, what is the most important job as a prophet or even as a disciple? Is it embarrassing other people that don't know it? Is it memorizing scripture? Is it getting down fire into the world and showing people that God is real? What is the most important job? Because when we hear the story of Elijah and the prophets of Baal, we can focus on so many things. It's a legendary battle. It's easy to get caught in the fire. The numbers, it's 450 versus one person. Get caught up on the altars, the victory, the stakes. Oh man, what if Elijah lost? You probably wouldn't have the rest of the Bible. But far too often, teens, I think we overlooked the reason why this one man stepped forward. There's one reason why this man challenged the prophets of Baal right before Elijah takes his sacrifice. He actually goes down in prayer and he explains to God why I'm doing all these things. 1 Kings 18, verse 37, it says, Answer me, Lord, answer me, so that these people will know you are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. That you are turning their hearts back again. That's what's most important for Elijah. The reason why Elijah steps up is to turn people's hearts towards God. It's not for the glory. It's not making people angry. It's not who's the best disciple, who's memorized the most scripture, but he steps forward to show people that God is the real God and the only God. He has a heart to turn people's hearts back to God. That's the most important part of the story. The fire, the prophets, the numbers, the speeches, sure, they're all impressive, but in 1 Kings 18, it's just a story of one man who has a heart to bring people back to God. So what's the most important job of being a disciple? What's the most important job of being in the teen's ministry? Is it A, song leading? Is it B, coming to conferences? C, listening to lessons? D, packing chairs like Noah? E, going swimming? F, preaching? I don't know. You can have many things that you want to do. And they're all important for sure. And we, we got to make sure we're not neglecting these things. But our main job, teens, is to step forward and turn people's hearts back to God. That's our main job. Do you have a heart to bring people back to God. Do you teens have a heart to bring people back to God? The teens ministry we've made in the spa region is meant to teach you guys how to turn people's hearts back to God, even in, all, in your own lives, in your own repentance, in your own character, in your own outreach, in your own talents. We have this teens ministry so that you can learn how I can turn my heart and other people's hearts back to God. It's always been about that. Wherever we go, whatever age we are, we need to focus on our main mission. I'll let Caden share a little bit. Okay. 
Yeah, so as disciples, we're called to stand up and step forward in reaching out to people like Elijah, to the uh, followers of Baal. Personally, I've been lucky enough to have a brother from school come to church and make the decision to be baptized. Yeah. This has been so encouraging, but it's also living proof that there are people out there who need and want God. Yeah. I remember getting challenged by Ben to invite friends to teens. This is when I asked Ben if he wanted to come to teens. And that question has led to him discovering God and changing his heart. Mm. Now Wen and I are sharing our faith in school together, as well as his sister has started uh, coming to teen devos. As Jesus said in Matthew 9, 37, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. God is calling us to reach out to our friends and change their hearts like Elijah did to the followers of Baal. Amazing. The teens ministry, as Caden says, it's not just a place we go on Friday nights where we read our Bible, we pray, we listen to the lessons. The great uniter in the teens ministry, the great uniter between all you teens is that we are all here to change people's hearts and bring them closer to God. That's why I'm actually so encouraged by Caden. You know, you don't need to know the Bible front and back. You don't need to be super knowledgeable or the smartest person or have another person in your friend group to share your faith with your friend. Because Caden had the faith to share and turn people's hearts back to God, we got an amazing disciple like Wen in this room. And now Wen's studying the Bible with his sister, which is amazing. But that's how God works when we step forward and we are focused on changing people's hearts. I'm going to let you guys know that Caden is not the only story of when God has given great victories to the people who had a heart to bring people towards God. In the spa region, that's our specialty. We have so many amazing teens that have great stories of knowing God. Let me tell you guys a few stories, right? Number one, Daniel Gouda had a heart to reach out to his friend and invite him on a Friday night. And he posted this chat on November 20, pray for my friend Howard Chang. He just finished baptism and we were waiting for his parents' decision. Hope he says yes. When this teen had the courage to step forward in faith and change his friend's heart, we got the new South Region campus minister, right? Alex Colantonio had a heart to reach out to his friends in school and she started studying the Bible. And guess what? Two years later, she gets hired by the church because Alex had the faith and courage to step up in the teen's ministry. You guys remember some of these teens? I'm going to show you guys a few photos. This is Andy. This is Raf and Melissa. This is Raf and Rodney. This is Jordan Benny. That's Steve, Rob, Matt Ritchie, and Felix, all church leaders. Right? These guys were born and bred in the teens' ministry. But what happened here, they learned to have a heart to reach out and turn other people's hearts to God. And they started doing the work of ministry. And every single day for their lives, they're making a difference. And they're bringing people closer to God. You want to see something spicy? Teen Camp 2012. Insane. You can't see the photos. But it is ridiculous. I'm going to turn up the brightness a little bit for you guys. If you guys scan the room, it's a little bit more tiny. But there are some really embarrassing photos that you should show your teen leaders. Because it is crazy. But did you know in this Teen Camp 2012, the teens ministry learned to step up and have a heart to reach out and turn other people's hearts, so much so that we have 13 people from this photo who are now working in the, in the ministry. Eugene, Lonnie, Raf, Howie, Azza, Elise, Melissa G, Mel Darvo, Sarah Hansel, Rob Mulhern, the one who made this event, Brooke May, Brandon Vasallo, Chloe Klein, all these people learned how to have a heart in the teens ministry. And they took the faithful step forward to bring other people and to, put, to devote their lives to this thing. When I look back in my days as a teens and even the teens before me, I am so glad to see how God worked and changed the lives of the teens ministry. And I'm so inspired to see how God inspired my heart and these people's hearts to step up and change other people's hearts as well. There are far more greater examples than all of this. But I want to teach you teens that when Elijah stepped forward against the prophets and Baal because he had a heart to bring people back to God, he won the battle. When the teens ministry, the entire spa region teens ministry, when it steps forward to change people's hearts, the whole church grows and God is glorified. My question for you this afternoon is do you have a heart 
to turn people back to God? Do you have a heart to turn people ha back to God? Do you have the heart to help your friends turn them to God? Because the next church leader, as you guys might know, they could be in your school. The next evangelist is probably ne in your group chat. That next disciple is probably your best mate. So who's going to step up and change their hearts? Because I wanted to give you a little secret. When I was in teens and when they were in teens and for the teens ministry right now, that's what the teens ministry has always been in the business in, stepping forward and sharing our faith. If you ask me who are the next church leaders, who are the next evangelists, next Bible talk leaders, they're in this photo right now. They're in this photo right now. You guys can change the world if you have the heart to do so. God wants to use you teens to change people's hearts so what's up right now? Let's step forward in faith. Learn to change people's hearts, right? It's just, you know, if you look at the story of 1 Kings 18, it's a story of how one man saw, saw half-hearted devotion and he became fully devoted, how one man challenged the culture, and how one man turned people's hearts back to God. That's what the teens ministry, that's what God has always been about since day one. Step forward, teens. Amen. To God be the glory.